part of the Sea Changes Festival, virtual festival, and the event tonight is Ocean Pollution, Practical Action on Plastic Pollution. And the event is part of a festival celebrating 10 years since the foundation of Sea Changes. Uh, my name's Theo Stocker. I'm the editor of Yachting Monthly magazine. And I was actually one of the founding trustees of Sea Changes 10 years ago. Um, and I've been working with Helen Webb and Rachel Laparta on that, along with a host of other people. Um, and I've just been one of the cheerleaders on the side, really. I'm a patron of the charity now. Um, so it's my privilege to be hosting this evening. Um, for those of you less familiar with Sea Changes, we've got a short film to show you what Sea Changes has been up to over the last decade. Um, and they've been giving out small grants to enable over 200 marine conservation projects and distributing over £150,000 in that time. So uh, I think we're going to queue up the video now. That's incredible, Helen and Rachel, who two amateur scuba divers who thought something needed to be done, got up and did it and have made all of that happen in the last 10 years. Well done, guys. Um, we'd also like to say a big thank you tonight to Extreme Ice Cream for sponsoring the festival and making this possible. Extreme is one of Sea Change's newest business partners um, and they're funding a tackling ocean plastics fund as part of Sea Change's main grant fund. Um, and that's starting from this autumn. Uh, if you know anyone who is involved in a project that might benefit from that fund, then please get them to apply. Just have a look on the Sea Changes website um, and there's a link there for how they apply. Um, the event this evening is completely free um, and that's fine. There's no entry fee, but we'd love it if you could show your appreciation by making a donation, if you felt able to. Um, if you go to uh, Just Giving Sea Changes, uh, you'll see the page pop up there. Um, and any money raised uh, this evening will go straight towards the Sea Changes main grants program. Uh, also, if you would like uh, to show that you've been along and that you care about the sea, then uh, we've got a range of festival T-shirts and hoodies um, with some great designs on them. Uh, look absolutely brilliant. Um, and they're available to buy via T-Mill, T-W-E-M-I-L. And I think uh, we'll share a link for that in a second in the, in the chat, which you should be able to see. So uh, what's this event going to cover? Well, the, the main focus of the event is we're going to see a, a really exciting trailer uh, for a forthcoming documentary called Plastic Warriors. Um, that's by Outpost Pictures. Um, and then we're going to move on and discuss some of the issues uncovered in the film. Now, uh, 
the person behind the film, Poppy Chandler, is a documentary producer, a camera woman, um, and one of the driving forces behind Outpost Pictures film um, that we're going to watch this evening. So uh, without further ado, oh, just to mention as well that Sea Changes was involved in the making of this film um, by providing a, a small grant uh, to help fund the documentary. So that hence the involvement. Um, but without further ado, we'll play the uh, play the trailer and then we will meet the other panelists. We've been running a research expedition for three years now, trying to gather as much information as possible about these creatures in order to understand them better and to be able to protect them. There's one day in particular where we found a lot of plastic based on the calculations that seemed to be almost half a kilo an hour. I was trying to calculate if we ate that amount of stuff in our cereal and uh, I don't think we'd survive very long. Microplastics are one of the world's most pressing environmental concerns. Plastic might be the asbestos of the new generation. And if they're small enough to reach the deep lung, then those chemicals will be able to enter our body. Plastic pollution and human health is the subject which nobody really dares address. Previously, we've always thought it's our shallow waters that humans are impacting. But as we've explored deeper and deeper, we found that actually humans have got into those deep water systems before even we've gone looking for them. We're talking about the disintegration potentially of the whole food web. We stand at the moment knee deep in the biggest pollution problem this country has ever seen and is ever likely to see. We're facing a real doomsday scenario and the threats are growing and we are running out of time. How are me and everybody in this school going to survive with all this plastic here? This primeval creature that has held on through all of the millennia and now might be brought down by plastic. Seems unbelievable. Thanks very much, uh, Poppy, for sharing that with us. Um, so uh, I'll just say who else we've got on our panel this evening. Um, and then what I'm going to do is I'll hand over to each of them just to say a little bit about uh, their work and their involvement in the subject of uh, ocean pollution and uh, practical action on plastic in particular. Um, so Poppy, uh, you're obviously a documentary producer, camera woman, and uh, you were involved in creating that film. Uh, on the couch with you tonight, uh, we've got uh, Ella Daesh, uh, environmental activist and uh, campaigning to end plastic waste generated by period products. We've got Kat Fletcher, uh, who is Brighton's resource goddess um, and one of the founders of Freegal UK, a website for reusing almost anything and everything. Uh, and then we've got John Vidal, a journalist and a former environmental editor of The Guardian. So thank you very much, guys, for joining all of us. It's a real privilege to have you here tonight. Um, so Poppy, first of all, do you want to just talk to us a bit about what you do and the making of this film in particular? Yeah, uh, thank you very much for having us along tonight, Theo. Um, yeah, so um, I must say it's not just me, it's Mike Wafer as well, the director. We're a filmmaking duo, um, although he's not here with us this evening. Um, but we've been making Plastic Warriors for the last five years now. Um, and it's a feature documentary that investigates Britain's addiction to plastic and tackles the biggest pollution crisis Britain has ever seen, as we just heard John tell us in the trailer. Um, and it shows the work of different scientists, um, meets different campaigners um, and explores Britain's wildlife um, from the deep sea coral reefs in the Atlantic Ocean to basking sharks, um, seabirds to seal colonies to find out 
what's happening firsthand um, and to uncover the true cost of the plastic pollution crisis. Um, we're really pleased that the film's got a very strong female-led uh, cast of contributors as well. Um, and we meet different innovators and designers and try and find out different solutions to the, to the crisis that's uh, affecting us all. Um, and yeah, we, we felt compelled, like many people, to um, try and um, do something about what's happening with the plastic pollution crisis. And as filmmakers, um, that, that's what we do. We tell documentaries and environmental stories. Um, and so we're very pleased that the film features different work from organisations, larger organisations like Greenpeace, the RSPB, um, to Surfers Against Sewage, as well as um, people like Ella and Kat and John, who I'm very pleased are all with us this evening. Um, and it's it's the story of the plastic warriors. It's a uh, it's a uh, it's a film that looks at what's happening um, through the different work that's happening. But it's also a positive film that I hope um, inspires action and shows that, for example, Ella, who uh, is a former poster worker turned environmental campaigner, that we can all make um, positive actions and we can all be part of the solutions. Um, in, in whatever way that is. So yes, the film uh, is a feature documentary that will be coming out this autumn in cinemas across the UK, um, all going well with COVID, obviously. Um, but yes, and we are very uh, pleased that the, so as part of the film uh, to get it made, we did apply to a, um, for a grant for Sea Changers and they helped massively with us being able to get to Scotland. And actually you saw in the trailer there, um, part of the Basking Sharks uh, research that we filmed, which was fantastic. A group of guys up in Scotland, Basking Shark Scotland, who, um, uh, not only run um, environmental tours where people can get out and, and swim with wildlife and things, um, but also run some brilliant citizen science products, uh, sorry, projects. Um, and they are looking at the impacts of microplastics on basking sharks, particularly up in Scotland. That's, that's absolutely brilliant. And just in terms of the making of the film, I'm just trying to imagine what it was like spending five years making the film and now seeing it come to fruition. Yeah. And what were some of the sort of either the best moments of making it or the worst or sort of the most shocking discoveries <laughs> that you, you came across, the bits that sort of really got to you? Uh, it's been it's been a long journey uh, being an independent filmmaker. Uh, it, it's been yeah it, it's been a journey I, I think the to be honest the the most shocking thing actually for us and one of the reasons we we wanted to make the film was at the time when this started it was all a case of well it felt very much in the media particularly it was um this is happening over there it's a problem in asia um it, it was being pushed on to other people um and you know we we felt particularly that um you know there was a there was a lot of iconic imagery that i think we're all familiar with like the seahorse wrapped with a cotton bud around its tail which is horrendous and the sea turtle with plastic in its nose and things and we felt that actually there's a lot happening in britain that we're perhaps not taking responsibility for and needs to be looked at and needs to be addressed. Um, and that's one of the things actually in the film we look at, as, particularly as our recycling system, um, which I know is very topical at the moment. But mm. in terms of what I found most shocking, I think it was, we went and did a, we were invited to a beach clean on the Thames. Um, and it was, I don't know if you guys remember, it was a couple of years ago when the Beast of the East was out and it was like a January day and we, had to park the car and we walked for like half an hour to get to this site and we went over this wall and uh i was just absolutely flabbergasted at the state of the beach like one of our british well it, it's a river beach but um you know uh and that it was this bad there was so much plastic it was really confronting to see that on british shores um and it really brought home that we do have a big problem in the UK and, and Western European countries as a whole, uh, but we've also got a very good um, 
community action groups around Britain, particularly where people are going out and they're making effort and they're cleaning up um, our plastic pollution on our shores. Hmm. Um, and and just in terms of, I mean, you, you mentioned some of those projects. What what are the most encouraging things that you discovered dur during the making of the film? What are the things that sort of stood out for you as sort of the glimmers of hope in what what's potentially quite a grim picture? I think everywhere we went, there were glimmers of hope. Whether it was talking to the scientists who were in Manchester, uh, Jamie Woodward, his team have just, uh, they've, they've brought out some more kind of pretty harrowing research about the sources of microplastic in our British river systems to, but um, to other to other people that are doing more positive kind or, or could be deemed as more kind of like positive proaction things but i think everywhere you go and you meet people generally the people that we met are really dedicated to wanting to either communicate the problem so as to bring about change um and or, or themselves are in direct action um themselves have either dedicated the work that they're doing um, to bring about positive change from, from actually physically going out and collecting the plastic pollution to um, creating their own campaigns or creating um, different networks that people can kind of look at their lives. I'm thinking of Cat here with Free Girl, um, where we can actually change systemically how we um, live our lives on a day-to-day -day basis. You know, it's not necessarily just about going and buying a reusable bottle. It's about looking at the stuff that we have around us and thinking, well, how can I actually change um, how, how I live and how maybe I consume less? And yeah, th there's, there's bigger things at play, I think, other than that just the plastic pollution issue. And I think that's what we've tried to discuss within the film as well. Yeah, yeah brilliant. Thanks, Poppy. Um, uh, you, you've just mentioned Kat there. So I think if, if we maybe jump to, to Kat now and just Kat, um, tell us a little bit about uh, Freegal and about what you're doing and why you're doing it. And, sure. Uh, yeah. Sure. So, I mean, I met Poppy on a beach a couple of years ago in Brighton on an August long weekend when, um, along with another lovely bunch of women in Brighton, um, I was helping run the biggest beach clean ever in the UK, where we had 1,500 volunteers and we mopped up uh, several tonnes of stuff off the beach on a, on a beautiful Sunday morning that had been left there by party revelers the night before, which is documented in, in, in Poppy's film. But, um, I mean, a little bit of context and, and, and just because of your background, Theo, so I actually come from a yachting family in Australia, but I've been in the UK for almost 30 years now, but I spent my entire childhood surfing and sailing and in the bush in Australia, very much in touch with nature. And Australia then, 30 years ago, was quite advanced. I can't really say the same thing now, but when I arrived in the UK 30 years ago, I left behind curbside recycling and I arrived here with absolutely zilch awareness about recycling or resource um, use or about infrastructure to kind of be more environmentally friendly. So just over the years, through doing lots of different things, I sort of ended up being part of a bunch of um, volunteers from all over the UK that in 2009 formed a reuse network in the UK called Freegal. And basically what that is, is just an, an, an online system where in your local area, if you have something that you don't want, you can list it on the site and then hopefully someone else on the site in your local area can make use of that item and they'll come and collect it from you. And it's a really simple idea and it might not seem like much, but actually it's incredibly useful because as a Western population, we generally overconsume and we, we just um, allow way too much stuff to enter into our into our lives, into our homes, into our offices, into our spaces. 
And so Freegal enables people, it's like online dating, if you like, for unwanted stuff. Yeah. And so it just allows you um, a really easy way of rehoming your unwanted stuff. So it doesn't end up in a bin, in a skip, at the tip, uh, going to waste. And so now, sort of 12 odd years later, across the UK, there are 450 Freegal reuse groups. There's 3.4 million people use Freegal to rehome their stuff. And but more importantly than the physical activity of passing on objects is it's also about changing mindsets. And when people declutter and they give away loads of stuff, it makes them feel good if they can give it to somebody that needs it. But it also draws attention to the fact that maybe they shouldn't have bought that in the beginning, you know? Like, why have I even got this stuff? And so I'm a little bit more... Um, politically activated than Freegal is as an organization. But um, I'm very motivated to encourage people to really look at the way they live their lives. And do you really need this stuff? And if you do, do you actually need to buy it new? Because if you're buying it new, it's probably coming wrapped in plastic. It is probably plastic whether it's a building material, an item of furniture, an item of clothing, an electronic gadget, you know, something for the kitchen, a toy for your children, it is bound to be made of plastic. And plastic is just a set of organic molecules that are fused together in a certain way, whether that's flexible or solid, or in whatever format it is. And it is actually the most incredible material in the world, which is why, in fact, it is saturated every corner of reality. But we have gone crazy. Plastic um, should not be used for single-use products. And so I would say that my, you know, the greatest message I can put out there is have a look at the items coming into your life and the items that you use in day-to-day -day life. And is should that object be single use? Does it have to be single use? And nearly always it does not. Nearly always there is a long-term um, product that is available that could be used for months or years or decades. And so these are the, um, the triggers that we need to ignite amongst ourselves is about what we consume, what comes into our life. So Freegal is one way of passing on stuff that you've accumulated in your life and making sure it has a second life. And that's incredibly important, incredibly worthy. In the last 12 months, over 11,000 tonnes of stuff has been Freegaled during lockdown, during COVID, during groups being closed, during it not being able to happen. Um, you know, saving something like 50,000 tonnes of carbon or something because you're not consuming something new by reusing something. So that's all really wonderful. But I, I think my message to everybody would be, like, you just need to really consider the objects that come into your life, how you consume them, consume them what they're made of, what you're doing with them, how long they last, and what you're going to do with them when you're finished with them. And if we all just had that conversation with ourselves before we procured something, we could really, really, really reduce the plastic um, consumption in, in the world. And um, it, we need a big shift, you know, and, and people need to stop buying brand new stuff when there's plenty of stuff around that you can either buy or, or get second hand you know you do not need to be buying brand new stuff we have made enough stuff we never need to make another coat hanger another coffee cup another shoelace another t-shirt I could go on um you know and I've got 12 shipping containers double garages all I do endlessly 24 7 is intercept stuff that people are discarding and I'm trying to hold it somewhere temporarily so I can redistribute it to someone that can reuse it. And I'm just telling you now, we do not need all this new stuff. And if people actively stopped buying brand new products, retailers, distributors, manufacturers, 
would stop making it because we were not buying it. And that would massively, massively reduce the production of plastic in the world. And, and I guess that's my message to everybody is just think about what you're actually doing, how you spend your money it can make a really big difference. And um, yeah, just think about how you want to live your life and think about your kids and your grandkids and people that have come after us and what kind of world do we want to leave for them? And I kind of want to leave a, a, a healthy planet you know, one that has ecology and beautiful animals and healthy oceans. And, and one of the biggest ways that we can make that happen is by being less abusive in our consumption. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Amazing. Thank you. Okay. Um, Ella, um, uh, Poppy mentioned sort of activists and people who have changed what they're doing and out there doing things. Um, you've got a pretty cool story do you want to sort of share what, what, you're doing, what you were doing and what you're doing now and 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 why sure yeah thanks for having me and similarly to Kat like I met Poppy and Mike on Brighton Beach as well when I was like a couple of months into what, yeah, yeah. A couple of months into what I was doing um and yeah I started all of this without any environmental campaigning experience you know I was a postal worker working for Royal Mail but as I was doing my day-to-day -day route in Cardiff at the time I was beginning to see the amount of waste increasing on the streets and it really began to make me worry really because that was just a few streets and it made me think about what impact we're having on a national scale so I started to make everyday switches, you know, like using a reusable water bottle or washable makeup wipes instead of disposable versions. And um, I was feeling really, really good about what I was doing. But then my period started and it's not something I'd ever really thought about that much. But as this waste was increasing in my bin, I was like, hey, what are we going to be doing about this then? And I did some online research. And I was horrified to discover that the products that I'd been using for so many years could contain up to 90% plastic. And it's one of those hidden plastics that we don't really think about because there's a massive taboo and stigma around it. You know, when we get our period education at schools, we're getting given branded products that start in a consumer cycle and we go back to them again and again. And we don't question what we're buying, what are the impacts of that? So I was really concerned about this, but I didn't really know what I could do. So I switched to eco-friendly products and felt good about that and was like, oh, someone else will do something about it. But <laughs> about a month later, I was walking around and still thinking about it and thinking this just doesn't make any sense. A, why are we making something that we're using just for a couple of hours out of a product, out of a material that is taking centuries to break down? And two, if small brands can make them without plastic, then so could these big brands too. And there was no excuse for them not to. So I didn't really know what I could do as an individual. I felt a bit powerless, but seeing other people taking action like Laura Corriton's period tax campaign, I decided to launch my own. And it kind of went big very quickly. I never expected it to. It got 100,000 signatures within just a couple of months. And I almost had to grow with that. It was very, uh, it was a very strange experience. Um, but I've learned so much since then. And I started it in 2018. In the first year, the manufacturers and retailers, they weren't really engaging with what I was doing. But then thanks to the support of thousands of people and my persistence, those have started to come to the table and now we're having really great things changing. So three of the UK retailers have removed plastic applicators from their period products, which is just one part of the problem, but it shows that they're willing to change. Mm. And they've said it's an unnecessary use of plastic, which coming from a retailer really speaks volumes. Yeah, it's amazing. And it's also leading to more conversations. You know, they're starting to launch their own eco-friendly products as well, which is great because, you know, a lot of people shop in supermarkets. It's the way that we need to make this mainstream a lot. You know, it's the only way most people yeah. shop and get those products. 
so that's amazing as well and also with the kind of like i don't know if many people know about the period poverty funding in the uk which makes uh, menstrual products freely available to those at schools and colleges i when i found out about that i thought you know what are we going to be spending that money on we need to spend this in a way that's better for the future of our planet and better for the people too so i started calling on those governments and councils to spend it in a way that tackles period poverty the plastic crisis and protects the environment all at the same time and i'm so pleased that this has had such a great response in wales where five of the councils have gone 100 percent eco-friendly with their funding and the government has also listened by making the decision for 50 percent of funding across wales to be spent in that way too it's so cool <laughs> like you. it's just really cool because also you make it really easy for other people who are overwhelmed and don't know what to do so they don't need to create that campaign they can just back yours and it's it, it's so wonderful what you've done because it's so logical as well and just to hold out government and business to like the illogical stuff mm. that they're putting out i mean Thank it's so very much. cool it's a really good example of how you just need to pursue like what makes sense to you and it's really great the effort you've made because it allows lots of other people to climb on your back and then it empowers everybody thank it's a very so very cool example of of eco activism yeah thank you so much um and oh. <laughs> i am yeah, um, really also with, throughout all of this, one of my biggest passions has been holding these brands accountable for what they're doing, because so often this goes unnoticed. And we're so brand led, especially in the period industry, you know, we don't mm. think about it, we just buy into it. So our periods are essentially marketed to us from a young age, and that's no. so wrong. And we need to be holding Bonkers. these brands accountable. They've got the money, they've got the resources to change period products are having a massive impact on the environment and 50 percent of the population mm, yeah. right 51 percent of the population yeah yeah exactly and something has to be done about it and that's also why i would encourage anyone that is really passionate about something to do something about mm. a cause they care about or something that they see because so i mean i love this um quote by um I can't think of the person right now, but she's like, um, the only way people give up their power by thinking they don't have any. And it's so true because we do. Angelou, I think. Yeah. Maybe. Yeah. yeah. And it's just so apt because we often do, especially with young people as well, you know, there's not they don't necessarily think they can do much about these things. These issues seem so big. And that's what I'm really passionate about also encouraging is other people to take action because we can do it. You know, before I started this, I thought it was all graduates or scientists, politicians that did this kind of thing. And I didn't think that I could do it, mm. but we all can. And it just takes that persistence and that passion to really take it further. And one thing I really would encourage people to do is also boycott brands that are doing the wrong thing, whether that's not paying their garment workers, whether it's making environmentally damaging um, processes with what they're doing. Because if doing the right thing isn't their jam, seeing their profit margins going down will make them act. So money talks, basically. Yeah, basically. How you spend spending. your money can have a massive impact. So if you're unsure about a product or a company, withhold your money yeah. until you've uh, researched it. And that's a little bit tedious at the beginning, but actually there are a zillion organisations and projects like Ella and like Ethical Consumer mm. and a whole range of um organizations and filters out there that can help you yeah. make sure that you're spending your money in a good way yeah. and and really all this is product related it's all a capitalist system yeah. of endlessly selling product to people yeah. and we need to resist that yeah. for starters and we need a change in the economic system we need to decouple people's livelihoods from the concept of endless consumption. Mm. And so one of the ways you can trigger that change is by boycotting, you know, period products yeah. that are unsustainable, that are full of plastic. 
It's not buying everything from big online companies that start with A and are <laughs> really, really uh, dr dreadfully wasteful. And I can only bring up the story this week of one big A warehouse in the UK that discards 130,000 brand new items every single week that are returned to them through their stupid bloody consumer process and they just destroy them they landfill them they incinerate them well stop buying products from those companies they have a bad business model it is not going to help any of us it is not going to help the planet it is not going to reduce plastic in in the oceans and and for us as individuals to um, empower ourselves by how we spend our money is a very good thing to do. Yeah. Definitely. Yeah. And I think it also goes beyond just the environmental impacts as well. A lot of Human these brands have massive ethical issues with how they treat staff, what they're doing. You know, there's so much that Absolutely. comes out all the time. See yeah, it. everything's interconnected. In, in fact, it turns out that all the good things you can do in the world you know, is reacting against all the existing um, profiteering um, yeah. machinations that's not helping humans and it's not helping the planet. Kelsa mm -hmm. Breeze. Yeah. Um, lovely. Um, we've got some questions. <laughs> Way too some... political. <laughs> <laughs> totally agree. I'm just looking at, looking at the clock. And we've got John sitting here very patiently, and I'd love to bring him in and, and hear yeah, his definitely. thoughts on the conversation. I'm well, aware too that we've got a couple of questions coming in from uh, some of our participants. Um, so we'll go back to um, Daniel, I've seen your question. I'll come back to that in a minute. But John, if we can bring you in at this point, and um, as, a, as a journalist, uh, a former environment editor, um, and, and also maybe you could just explain to us a little bit what your involvement in the Plastic Warriors film was and then what your sort of engagement with these issues are more, more widely. Well, um, uh, it all comes back to me. My first ever job at university was working in a plastics factory in Birmingham and I was making plastic lavatory seats. <laughs> and that's how I... <laughs> Funding my university. Yes, thank you, the plastics industry. You were wonderful. I had two and three an hour, or whatever it was, and long lived it. Anyway, no, um, and my involvement, okay, the, first of all, we should all get to Brighton Beach because obviously everything happens there. That's where you meet. That's where you meet. It's, it's clearly the place to go for education and for illuminating and uh, I'm in Wales and so I understand very much out of what you're saying and uh, North Wales you know we still want you to come up here and have a talk you know talk to guys oh, up here but yeah. that'll, that'll go um the one thing which uh, and then coming back why why Poppy and this film um first of all the film is brilliant I mean we uh, we have a little um uh, nature festival every every year or we did until Covid came along and uh, we asked um, Poppy and think to, to, to show the film and we had an audience of about 50 60 people or whatever everybody was stunned it was quite extraordinary we've all seen the films by Attenborough we've all seen the big international ones what nobody had seen was actually what was happening here in Britain right round here yeah, in, Italy, in our streams in our rivers in our seas in our world. It's all being, you know, posited as a sort of global problem. It is a global problem, but but what this film has done is it brought it right back home, and Poppy and Co have really found the best people to talk to, and they've got some really fantastic um, uh, voices to 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 go with some extraordinarily good filming. So when it comes out in the autumn or whenever, you know, do please go and see it. It, it, it is tremendous. Now. What, the one thing which really occurs to me, which I, it never struck me until very, very recently, was that plastic is oil. Let's get it into our heads. It's a oil. It is not some magical man-made thing. It comes directly from oil. Therefore, it is linked absolutely into the climate crisis, into all these other problems which we're having, the air pollution and the, the health problems and so on and so on. And until we understand that this is a toxic substance which is actually going to do us no, no good whatever, 
Um, and we don't know what the health effects are going to be. We don't know on the large scale or on the small scale. I had my blood tested a few, well, actually it was a year ago, um, by some um, uh, Dutch uh, microbiologists to see how much, how much plastic I had in my blood. They still haven't come back to me. I suspect that they're so shocked that, that uh, it's, it, I mean, we don't know. We really do not know how much we're inhaling, how much we're, we're in, 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 uh, consuming. Uh, it is in now in absolutely everything. If you wash your clothes, you can guarantee that you're going to be breathing in the, 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 the microparticle. If you go to the sea, you can guarantee that you will swallow large amounts of, of, of plastic particles. No one has done the work yet. It's, it's, it, we just do not know. Um, the other thing which, is, which, which occurs to me is that the film is obviously about UK, Britain, our waters here, our seas here. Two things. Number one, this is, this is not a problem with the seas. This is a problem of the cities. It's starting elsewhere. It ends up in the sea. The sea is the repository. What starts in, in, in I don't know, in Upper Cardiff or in, in Langothlan or wherever it is, it all ends up in the sea. So we're all responsible. It's not just about the, 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 the marine environment. God bless sea changes and everything like that. But it is, this is all of our problems. Um, and the second thing is, this is now global. And if you, um, I could go to African villages, you know, 20 years ago, 10 years ago, even five years ago, and you'd never see any plastic at all. And now the streets are strewn with it because most of the world has not got any sort of um, recycling capacity. It's just as simple as that. There's nothing they can do. So it's, it's just impossible to, to, to get rid of. And the, second, the third thing, is that there's terribly few companies are responsible for what's going on. So there's maybe half a dozen companies which are producing 55, 65% of all the plastic waste. Um, and we know kind of the food companies and the takeaway companies, the, the big A companies, there's the, the big B companies as well. And uh, so in fact, they're very vulnerable. And this is what we don't realize is that, that, it, the, that because there are so few, we have a, an enormous power to get them to change. And we saw this with the ozone hole 20, 30 years ago, because there are only six companies which were making the fluoro, fluorocarbons, it was very easy to legislate and to persuade them to, 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 to change their, their, their production. And they did. And I think the same could happen very well with, with, with plastic, that we could very easily get uh, get the very few companies to um, to do their thing, um, and it's getting worse. I mean, that's the the the, the other thing. Can you guys hear me? <laughs> yes. Yeah. Yeah. We can hear you, John. Yeah. <laughs> I'm so sorry. I didn't. Okay. Very last point. Um, it's getting much worse. Okay. So the oil companies have been really hit by the electric car revolution and, and all of these things. There is the the, the climate uh, revolution is happening right now. And everybody is aware of climate in every part of the world and every country and every company is being asked to reduce its emissions. Uh, but the oil companies are going to lose a huge amount of money if they cannot sell their product. So what they've done very cleverly is that they've moved into plastics. So they, their profits increasingly over the next 20, 30, 40 years are going to come from plastics. And if you look at how many new massive plastic works, plastic factories are being built in America, in Japan, in India, especially in the developing world, uh, and in Europe, you will realize that the plastic production is going to not just double over the next 20 years, but inevitably is going to triple. In other words, they'll be finding uses for plastic, which we have not even imagined yet. And there has been no response from government. There's a lot of airy-fairy rhetoric, which comes out of the G7s and G8s and G20s and IPCCs and things like that. But actually, in fact, very, very little is being done. And the, the companies themselves are keeping very quiet and trying to pretend to be green. It's a, it's, we really do have to do exactly what Ella was saying, exactly what Poppy was saying, exactly what people say. We have, we have to really put the pressure on them. And they do not like it. They hate it when individuals say we're going to withdraw our custom from, from period things or, or from, from food or whatever it might be. The more people we can get, the, it, the, 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 the faster we will get change. Change is quite possible. It's not, there are all these um, 
alternatives are now coming out. I subscribe to this wonderful magazine called, I don't subscribe, they send it to me, called Plastics and uh, Rubber and Plastics. <laughs> it's a monthly magazine and they tell me what the industry is doing. They are terrified. I can tell there's all the whole thing now is about how do we get more people to recycle? What can we do with the recycling industry? How can we make a new industry out of recycled materials and products and things like that. They know what the problem is, but it does need us in every way, all of us, to sort of one last heave and the buggers are gonna fall over. Let's, let's all just you know, create new groups, new sea change groups or whatever it is, new plastic groups, new, new waste picking groups. Uh, let's tell them, let's send it back to them. If you see a McDonald's plastic, whatever it is, send it back to them, put it in the post, put all the, the, the sachets and the beauty products and all the, 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 the plastic, which we cannot get rid of. Let's just put it in the post, send it back to them, keep telling them it, it's the only way we will get change. If we do not get this change now, I promise you in 10 years time, in 20 years time, the problems we think we have now will seem as absolutely nothing because it is growing so far and so fast that it is now completely out of control. So it's up to us. We have to find somehow alliances between UK and Ireland and, and Europe and Japan and Bangladesh and Malawi and wherever it is. And together, we've just got to tell these companies we don't want their products. I think, I honestly think that will be the best way. So sea changes, absolutely fantastic. But remember, it is not just the sea, it is everywhere. It starts in the, uh, in the cities and the towns and the drains, and, and it ends up in the sea. And for everybody else, it is a local problem, but it is also a regional and international problem. So thank you very much. Anyway, it's, it's, it's wonderful to talk to you. Thank, Great thank film, you. by the way. Excellent film. <laughs> Um, John, John, I'm really interested in your uh, points there about sort of personal action and, but on this sort of international problem. What are the sort of the, I mean, you've mentioned a bit about governments, a bit about sort of the products that we're choosing to buy. Sort of economically speaking, what's the, what are the biggest changes or globally speaking, what are the biggest changes that you think need to happen and need to happen quickly? Well, I think you could go for the, you know, the ban on single-use plastics. I mean, that, that almost goes without saying. And, uh, and I think that's where they're most vulnerable, is to, is to see change there. Because they can very easily change to recyclable products um, and to... Reusable, um, John. Reusable products. Sorry, reusable. I'm so sorry. Yes, I mean, uh, I, I'm not on Brighton Beach. I would, I would get it right. I, I speak a, another language up here. Uh, the reusable, um, reusable product at every point, and uh, so that, that that's number one. But number two is is just to make sure that everything, everything is reusable. So if you buy a car, write to the company and say how much of it is reusable. They they employ people to to listen to each other to listen to, it. and and we have to you know get them get them going. It's a it's a very simple. It starts with you guys on Blight Brighton Beach. It then comes to Wales and then it goes to wherever it is. But that's what's happening. And as you say, there are four hundred thousand you know groups doing their their, their their reusable stuff, and there are forty million. Everybody knows this is a problem now. All we need to do is find some way where we can get the message coordinated and to really hone in on the big companies because the big ones after when the big ones fall all the other ones fall after that so once we can get hold of coca-cola and, 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 and amazon and let's name them and and um, you know once once you get them to change force them to change and you will force enormous change around the industry but it's a but remember all the time this is a climate problem as well it is really this is going to produce more emissions than 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 gasoline over the next 20, 30 years. Thanks, John. Um, I think it's probably time to go to questions from, from the floor, uh, and then we can have, have some discussion around that. Um, coming back to, I'll, I'll start with Daniel's question, because he asked it a while ago, and he sat there very patiently waiting for us to answer it. Um, this is open to any of the panellists who want to dive in and grab the question. But uh, Daniel asks, does the government need a minister or personnel who investigates these issues? So we were talking about, um, uh, I, th I think we were talking about companies and what they're doing with the plastics and actually holding them to account at a, at a governmental legislative level. Um, should we be 
pushing the government to, to to be actually holding itself and holding the companies that operate in this company to account uh, on plastic? So I'll just briefly comment to say that the government has run consultations over the last two years, uh, specifically over um, waste management and over plastics. And at this very precise moment this week, they are being analysed by independent sustainable uh, companies who will then feed back the evidence to the government of what was reported in those consultations. Um, so rather than create more labyrinth of government and complexity, what we could actually do is just actually do what is already built in to um, guidelines um, governance, directives, and legislation. An example of that is that for a very long time, we've already had legislation that says that all plastic products should be labelled so that you can see what type of plastic they are, so that you can identify them, so that you can recycle them and get them to their correct stream. We've also had uh, extended producer responsibility legislation in place for decades and the government doesn't actually hold anybody to account. So instead of creating more bureaucracy and more committees and more agency, if we could just narrow it down actually, and we already have guidelines and directives and legislation in place and also projected new guidance and legislation that's about to come forward, if we could focus on that and get that really right. So right this week in the House of Lords, the Environment Bill for the UK is being debated. It's a 25 year plan that's really integral to how we go about assimilating all these changes through government initiative funding, through driving business change, through enabling consumers and so we need to make more of that. It already exists. We just don't use it properly. And um, we need to ask our governments and demand of our governments that they actually follow through on legislation that already exists and that they proactively enable positive change in future legislation. So I don't think it's about kind of getting some new czar of waste or anything. It, it, it's about actually just taking care of business and actually doing it and holding people to account. This already exists and we don't do it. Do you think it would it'd be possible to make uh, some law or some uh, action which would force the companies which make the plastic, which sell the plastic, to take it back and to reuse it? Would, would so that be possible? I could just tell you, John, that already there are four extended producer responsibility sets of legislation in the UK, and they're around batteries, cars, plastic packaging and electronics, and our government does not hold people to account for that legislation. It already exists and we don't do it. So if you create and produce and distribute plastic packaging, you are already legally, technically responsible for the end of life of it, but nobody in government is holding them to account. So there's something going wrong in the lobbying or the business negotiations between huge industries and government. So uh, I think we just need to reveal this to the world. So the reason why you can recycle batteries in every supermarket in the UK is because there is an extended producer responsibility legislation in place for batteries. It exists as well for plastic packaging, but the government does not hold the industry to account. So idiots like myself and thousands of other community projects all around the UK are, are trying to randomly capture plastic packaging and waste and get it into their hands and then send it off there. And they're doing it all voluntarily, not paid, not funded, when actually there's legislation that says that that should happen. Well, where is the accountability? Like, there's, there's a lot of issues here that 
that we actually have things in place legislatively that should mean that we're not in the pickle we're in now. But somehow the government has just squirmed through all these things. Uh, sorry, all a bit contentious, but yeah. But yeah. really, it is all there. And, and, and I run electronics projects and packaging projects and all sorts of things. And, you know, electronics is a really big problem. So 60% of the materials in electronics are plastic. And it's the fastest rising waste stream in the world. And there is already legislation in place to say that this stuff should not go to waste. But our government and the agencies involved are not held accountable. And so there's just all these loopholes and, and slip streams where things fall out of the system. But the, the, did not the Chinese and other countries, have they said they will not take any more imports of, uh, of, of plastic from Very good. Western Very good. So why could not Britain, Europe, Ireland, Wales, whoever, why could we not say the same? Is that, would that not make a, force the issue a bit? Absolutely. We should all be dealing with our own waste. We should have really thorough, um, proper infrastructure in place to capture goods when they're discarded so that you can maximise the resourcefulness of those materials and products. And uh, it all does actually exist in legislation, but nobody is held to account. So I think it's a good thing that we keep our waste within our borders. And actually it's an opportunity for economic growth and for business and for new industry to rise to the occasion. Hmm. Thanks guys. Um, uh, just a, a brief yeah. one. We've got a few questions coming in about the film Plastic Warriors. Um, we've got a couple of uh, participants in the US who are very keen to see it and want to know how and when they can see your film. Can they host a watching party? Uh, yeah. how, 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 how is this going to be shared around the world and when, when can we get to watch it? I uh, would love you guys to, sh to host the watch party and thanks for your uh, excitement about our film. Um, yeah, it's, it's going to be out uh, across the world soon. Um, I don't have specific dates at the moment. The best thing to do is we've got a website um, called Plastic Pioneers. I can put it in the link in a link in the chats. Um, PlasticPioneersDocumentary.com and in there there's a newsletter which you guys can sign up to or PlasticWarriorsDocumentary.com for UK um, residents um, just because it's got a different title for different regions um, but yeah and we'll send out uh, information as soon as it's going to be released but yeah the UK release will be autumn um, internationally um, I will have to let you all know but hopefully it'll be soon it's so cool there's people in America watching yeah it's great that there are people in America, part of this. And in Wales, and in Wales, we're watching oh, this. No, no, no. Wales. No. Wales is doing amazing things. Wales is doing. Wales is doing amazing yeah, things. The most sustainable country on, in 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 in. Well, in Wales, anyway. I mean, Ella was annoyed that I didn't tell Wales. you, tell her that she, you were in Wales, John. Yeah. I'm sorry. But, but you know, if you're in America, there, there's a really amazing website, which is an American website called fivegyres.com. And if you're in the USA and you want to be proactive and reduce your plastic use and find out what you can do, fivegyres, G-Y-R-E-S.com, they have amazing information on there and um, that that's where you can go in America to kind of get some guidance and on how to behave better and what you can do to help the cause. Um, just on behaviour, um, uh, Greg has asked us, uh, what can we do about supermarkets um, who are one of the worst single use plastic polluters? Uh, the argument about uh, plastic preventing food waste and all of the air miles that go with that. Supermarkets also have plastic reduction targets in place, but everything seems to be moving so slowly. Yeah. So, um, what can we what can we do about that? Uh, I mean, 
Go Ella. Ella, maybe you'd like to comment on that because that's... Um... Yeah, yeah. I think there's so much potential with supermarkets because they really listen to consumer demand and can change in a way so much quicker than manufacturers can. So throughout my work, I've been talking to manufacturers like Procter & Gamble, Lillette's, but also retailers like Tesco, Sainsbury, Superdrug Boots. And those retailers are the ones that are so often able to actually do things a lot quicker and they listen to people right so as i was saying in my speech like in the first year no one was listening no one was listening and with superdrug for example this is just one part one one of the decision makers on the campaign they weren't engaging with me so i asked people to send them emails and we got thousands and thousands of emails sent through to their offices and it completely stopped what they were doing and made them kind of take note and think actually we do need to engage in this you know mm. by continuing to make that noise you can really do something about it because oh, sometimes these people you know they're everyday people that work behind these brands and retailers you know they might not think about something that you see is a problem and if you engage with them and you take that problem to them that is powerful you know you're actually what you know you're working with them to bring about change and that's something that i think we need to do a lot more of and we need to be encouraging and empowering that action a lot more because with supermarkets you know we always go in there to do our regular weekly shops yeah. Ella, do, do, you, do you know about the, um, the the trolley protests of the anti-apartheid movement? I mean, we're talking going back to the 80s. You're far too young. But there was a very, very effective one which was used throughout Britain, was that people would go into supermarkets and they would collect all the South African produce they could find. They'd put it into a trolley. They'd go up to the checkout desk and they'd say, oh, here you are. They let them check it out and they say, sorry, I'm not buying it now. In other words, they then had to put it all back on the shelves and whatever. They yeah. got so angry, <laughs> but it brought the mess back right to the yeah. individual supermarket. So I, I just think we can be very creative here as well as, as uh, you know, not just send an email, but yeah. actually, you know, put yeah. a bit on the line and, and, uh, yeah. and, and, and let the buggers know because yeah. they're not going to do anything unless we tell them. <laughs> exactly we have to keep going back and back and again and it's exactly. great to get creative with it as well so like one of the things that i've done with my campaign is i got lots of tampon applicators from uk beaches and with the help of my mum i turned it into a giant tampon applicator and that was just made from tampax applicators and this yeah. is a massive you know that they have a massive stake in in this issue procter and gamble do um, so that was kind of a really big statement as to showing this problem because you walk past one or two and you don't necessarily think much about it, but you see 1,200 of them together in a six foot sculpture, you're going to take notice. So I think there's so much that we can do and get creative with it, like you say, and get on social media. You know, social media has changed activism so much. You know, if that wasn't about it, wouldn't have um, my campaign wouldn't be what it is today. Um, and it wouldn't be reaching all the people. I think you could, it would be really interesting with, with all the masks which we're all having to wear, even in Wales. Um, I mean, there's one billion of them every week being used or being thrown away. They're ending up on the beaches. We've seen yeah, them on yeah. the beaches of West Wales and North Wales and wherever. Uh, I mean, over the next 10 years, they're all plastic. And over yeah. the next you know year or two, they're going to be mountains of this stuff. Yeah. Well, why isn't someone you know, getting onto the NHS about this. I mean, we should all yeah. be going to our hospitals and whoever, or, or Mr. Hancock, uh, oh, a, a poor exactly. man in London, and, yeah. and, and send, sending them to him because it's 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 an outrage. They could easily make fabric ones which 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 do not require exactly. or which are reusable. Exactly. They can, and the thing is, as well, like when we were past this first wave, um, the first lockdown, you know, what the government really should have done was to make reusable masks available to every household, to every person in the UK, actually exactly. giving them yeah. out for free. Yeah. Like we shouldn't be, you know, the government incentives like that, you know, just doing that for our residents. Yeah. Well, that's what we yeah. should be doing. 
it's just yeah. it's yeah. it doesn't make any sense that we're using so many like that and yeah um, and just to come back to the supermarkets question in terms of uh, particularly i guess with fresh food and the arguments there are there are there things that we think supermarkets could be doing or should be doing in terms of fresh food and the plastic wrappers that that all comes in yeah unfortunately a lot of the time they they talk about like the expiry you know the quality of the product for like for example cucumbers or salad and with some of it i think they find it i don't know they find it hard to come up with an alternative but things like strawberries you can have them in a cardboard box mm. and you could just pick the box up you know like you, you see them at farmers markets and everything like that why can't these massive brands be doing that they cert they certainly could be and there's not any excuse really for them not to and we get so many packets of like multi-packs you know you get four tin four tins of baked beans wrapped in plastic for a, a multi-pack deal mm. well you should just be able to pick the four cans up there shouldn't be any plastic around it, you know? Or you get like a coconut, which famously <laughs> comes in its own like wrapping itself, like a husk that means it can last for a long time. And then that's been shaved off around the edge and then put into plastic packaging. Mm -hmm. I think we've got a, there is definitely a massive uh, problem with food waste, which is a huge, huge issue, but also we've got to weigh up what the, the kind of like quick alternatives of just plastic packaging everything is doing mm. just to make it more convenient to sell um cool thanks guys um uh, we've got a, a question from denise in uh indiana in the usa um about uh people's attitudes who maybe aren't engaged in these issues um i mean her, her question specifically was about uh what goes through people's heads when they're just throwing rubbish away um i guess how do we how do you reach and educate and change the behavior of consumers and people who for whom this isn't a priority or for whom they're not aware of the issues or they have bigger fish to fry they feel they have other things concerns to deal with in their lives other than uh plastic uh and and their sort of environmental impact how how do we how do you reach those people how do you change those minds when you're sort of talking about individuals rather than governments or companies i think i think um for example one of that was one of our motivations for the film is to to kind of like continue on the conversation to bring it to a wider audience and one of our distribution plans for the film is to um, ensure that it's shown in different community groups where perhaps the environmental conversation um, is not necessarily engaged with. Maybe it's more urban areas, maybe it's more rural areas and stuff where they may feel they're not um, they're not part of the kind of coastal um, plastic pollution problem, perhaps. So that's a big thing for us is to ensure that the film is shown as far as it can be. Um, and I think also that... Um, it's just, it's, it's talking and it's talking about the issues of the work, for example, that Sea Changes is doing is really good because it's enabling different community groups up and down the country to, um, to be able to take the spark of an idea of what they might want to do wherever they are and turn it into an actual action-based group as well. Um, so I think things like that's really good. And, and, you know, for example, yeah. Yeah, I think as well, like a lot of the time, a lot of people get stuck on the affordability. Yeah. You know, yeah, when yeah. I was a postal worker, I, you know, one of the first things that I was trying to do was I was trying to cut down for the environment, but also a massive plus of that was the affordability of it. You know, mm -hmm. you're buying one bottle and you're reusing it again and again. You're buying a reusable period product. You're using it for years. And it also, so I also think that when we're talking about environmental problems, we shouldn't just talk about the environmental issues. We should also talk about the really positive things as well, like saving money. And also a lot of the time it's better for our health as well. And a lot of people don't speak about that. But unfortunately, sometimes affordability can be a problem for people, but it's about making it accessible and inclusive. And by having those conversations, with the people around you that you can really connect with that makes a huge difference because everyone is in a different 
bubble everyone's in a different situation they've got different things that are going on in their lives and by speaking to them on a very non-judgmental level you're able to open that up in so many more ways and they're going to listen to you more it, does, it doesn't always work though i'll tell you <laughs> what i was i was driving up the lane a few years ago and there was a car in front of me and the guys in front had obviously just been to mcdonald's or wherever and they were chucking out stuff left right and center so uh, um, we, we, we got to a, a sort of a, 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 another road and I, I, I got out of the car and I went up to the guy and I said, do you realize you've just been throwing away all this plastic and whatever it was? And he opened the window and then he opened the door. He was six foot nine. And <laughs> I was, I've never been more frightened in my life. In other words, we have to be, have to be quite careful which, oh, yeah. which enemies we choose. <laughs> <laughs> But unless unless we get to the you know to the person on the street as well as to the company director and the fast food outlet and the whoever, it's not going to work. But but I think I actually think that there is enough of a of a headway. The the the, the winds of change are, are here. There's so much positive stuff. It comes out of the Attenborough films. It comes out of you know all, uh, amazing new awareness because of what's happening on Brighton Beach and whatever. But it, but it's it's it, you can tell that there is change and people are now more aware. On the beach which I go to in West Wales, we used to see much more plastic than we do. And I, last last week or whenever it was, two, three weeks ago, I was there, didn't see anything at all. And it was amazing. It was one of the hottest days of the year. And there were hundreds of people there and there was no plastic. I was looking for it. I was very disappointed. I, I, I thought I'd pick a pick an argument or something. But there was no there was no plastic. I think we are getting through in different ways. And I think it's a question of of just keeping up the pressure and uh, and and you know as 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 as, as Ella was saying persevere. Well, somebody was saying persevere, and somebody was saying um, uh, pers pursuit. And I think if we pursue and we persevere, we will be, you know, we will we will get there. But we have, it's just it's bloody hard work, and we just have to keep at it. It yeah. is, and I also think sometimes in a lot of different communities we don't actually engage them with the environment. So today I was um, working with some children from Tower Hamlets in London that have never been to the beach before. And how can we expect them to care about an environment mm -hmm. when they have no connection to that environment? Mm -hmm. You know, and, and they did care, which was amazing. But we need to like link that, which is why things like Plastic Pioneers and Warriors um, film is so important because it's connecting us to the problem locally we see all these far flung places and it's hard to connect with that but when we're seeing what's actually happening in our countries in our rivers in our like coastal communities it helps connect us to it and we're always going to get people who are never going to be unfortunately on the same level that we're at you know there are some people that we unfortunately can't win over but we have to move past them and concentrate on the people that we can inspire and that we can empower to bring about change. Mm. Great, Th thanks guys. Um, uh, we've got, it's uh, quarter past eight, so we've got a few minutes left. So uh, we'll try and squeeze in a, a couple of questions before we have to round up. Um, we've got a question from uh, Ian, uh, and this comes back a little bit to the legislative government uh, points that we were discussing earlier. Um, about is there anywhere in the world that has used taxes uh, on producers of plastic products, plastic waste, and the proceeds uh, from that to fund recycling and cleanup? So I guess the, the automotive industry does this a little bit in the cost of a new car, includes some of the money for scrapping old cars, uh, and that goes into a central pot. Is there anything around the world where governments have been taxing plastic producers and using that money for the problem of plastic pollution? I think about 120 countries now have official bans on the use of uh, single-use plastic. And it works, the, the history is, it started in Bangladesh in about 1989, 1990, and they closed down all the plastic bag makers. And, uh, and it was very successful for about you know, a year or two years. And then slowly they came in and that's what happens everywhere is it starts off with a, with a very good law and, uh, and, and there is a huge reduction in, 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 in plastic 
bag use. And then it builds up again and again and again. But I think, I mean, here in Britain, there is a tax on plastic bags and, you know, and that raises a lot of money and it is hypothecated. It goes, does go back eventually somehow, not quite sure how, into the environment. So yes, there's, a, there's, there, there, there's definitely a, uh, it is being used. This sort of taxation is being used, but it could be used far, far more, you know, with cars or with all the other uses of plastic, I agree. So that might be one that we could be pushing for and uh, yeah, change it so that, as you were saying, um, Ella, that if things are more affordable, then people are likely to make a simple economic decision to go for the cheaper product that happens to be yeah. reusable, environmentally friendly. Um, yeah. I mean, and I guess businesses will do the same if taxes encourage them to, to, do, to do so as well. Yeah, I mean, really we shouldn't be paying more for products that are environmentally friendly. We should be having to pay more for products that are environmentally damaging. Yeah. And we also, so should our governments are making the decisions that are better for our future, or they should be making decisions that are better for our future. And so they should be holding those brands accountable and they shouldn't just be in bed with them in some way. Mm. Yeah. <laughs> unfortunately <Okay. Or> Theo. <laughs> um, uh, lovely there's another question here about uh sea spiracy obviously the um netflix documentary on the sort of the impact of the fishing industry um uh and uh the uh asking where the panelists really whether the the view that actually the fishing industry is a huge part of the problem with ocean plastics in particular um or whether that's not fair and whether as john says actually the problem starts in the cities and the towns um sort of which which end of the spectrum does the problem start or is the is the worst cause of ocean plastics i think um i think sea spirity is highlighted um to the masses what the big issue with the fishing industry mm. is um, I think that's brought it to a lot of our you know our living rooms um, I think it's made it very accessible to a lot of people it's something that many people don't speak about mm -hmm. um, many charities don't speak about it the gov a lot of governments don't speak about it um, it's a massive industry I mean the you know industrial fishing is having a massive impact on the on the planet it's it's doing irreparable damage to the sea and to the sea floor to life in the sea and um, we really have to be thinking about the way that we are consuming again it's that consuming yeah right we need to be thinking about that and in this country we have got a choice about what we eat mm. we've got the power of being able to use our money in a way that we see fit and that's not true for all countries you know there are a lot of coastal communities that are being pushed out with the way that the fishing industry is going you know fish fish is like one of their only resources of food i wouldn't say that you know those those communities should be having this focus on them but it is the western you know how we consume that we can actually have an impact with that for sure probably a good example of that is one of the biggest seafood uh, distributors in Brighton who supplies restaurants but also supplies householders and citizens um, you know less than 10 percent of the product available is locally sourced so they actually drive to London and go to a massive national fish market in London to buy produce and bring it back here to Brighton and then sell it to people. And they don't actually connect with the seafood, um, um, uh, the seafood industry here on the coast that are actually procuring seafood. They don't buy seafood from them. They completely bypass them. They go to London. To the, to the fish market and come back here and then sell it. It's completely ridiculous. There are supply models in business that are just broken. They're just so broken that they're entrenched in decades of kind of repetitiveness and habitual behaviour 
And so as consumers, in a very polite way, you can absolutely challenge that. Like, I'm sorry, I don't want to buy seafood from you because it's not from our local area. You've brought it in from 100 miles away. Why have you done that when it's available two miles away? So I just come back to, I'm sorry, people have to, it's a bit boring as a person just trying to get on with your life and buy food and buy products and have clothing and have a house, but you actually have to analyse what you're buying and where you buy it from and just don't buy stuff from people that are doing the wrong thing. And in a polite way, you can just point out to them and say, I'm really sorry, I'm not buying your fish platter. It's imported from 14 different countries over thousands of kilometres. Why don't you create a Brighton platter from the local guy, which will change every week? So, um, I mean, not to put all the responsibility on individuals, because I think we're just, we're cursed, you know, we're stuck, we're trapped in a really broken system. But there is a way that we can kind of break that bad system and so just think about how you spend your money, where you spend it. Try not to be lazy, you know, make an effort. Great. John, did you have something to add there? And then, and then we'll wrap yeah, up. Yeah, I, I, I never saw um, Cisper. I, I do know a bit about the, the, the fishing industry and it's just absolutely ghastly. I would say that the, for many, many other industries which are almost as bad, in their own way, but are quite hidden because we don't see them. So the farming industry, outrageous okay, amounts of plastic being used. I mean, unbelievable amounts, um, you know, to grow food under, to to pack stuff up and whatever. Um, so there's that one. The, uh, the, the the plant industry, when you buy a, 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 you know, a rose or whatever, it always comes in plastic. Why? It's just insane. I mean, it's completely insane. And, and we're talking about billions of plants here, billions of plastic. And how many of those pots, those plastic, those, those flower pots, are yeah. actually recycled or reusable? Really good ah, nothing, nothing at all. Great I mean, in the, we should just say, go just into these industries and say, just, I, I'm not going to buy this because ah, if you get a sticker, get a sticker or something, which you just put on something you don't like to say too much plastic or whatever it is. But I mean, get, you get at them. I mean, you know, Brighton Beach, start there and... Uh, and <laughs> Yeah. just stop it <laughs> <laughs> well i think that's probably a really good note to end on just to get out there and get at them so um guys to poppy ella cat john thank you very much for your time this evening uh to everyone watching thanks for coming along make sure that you sign up i think in the chat there's a link to get a new sign up to the newsletter for plastic warriors so that you can get notified when that comes out Make sure you watch that and share that with everybody. Um, if you haven't done so yet, do please donate to Sea Changes and support the amazing work that they're doing all around the coast, um, supporting grassroots marine conservation products. Absolutely brilliant work they're doing. Um, if you want a hoodie or a T-shirt, go to uh, T-Mill Sea Changes, have a look at there. There's also a couple of other offers that have popped up in the chat while we've been talking. Um, uh, I think you've got a discount on Coast magazines, you've got a discount on Sea Changer wines. Um, so there's lots of stuff to take benefit from. Just scroll back up through the chat and I guess we might be able to email those out as well. I'm not sure. Um, uh, and don't forget that this is event number two in a festival of four events. Um, so there's another event, two more events on the 29th and 30th of June. We've got uh, the Deep Sea is one of them on the 29th of June. And then we've got Community Marine Action on the 30th of June. And if you go back to the event bright page, there's a whole load more information there. So do have a look, stay involved and go out there and get at them, as John says. Thanks very Thank much. You.